the way an economy and a society treats workers can be seen by how it treats its retired workers. Mm. Hello and welcome to The New Conversation. I'm Dwight McBride, president of The New School, and I am pleased to welcome you to season three of The New Conversation, a series where we converse with distinguished writers, creators, and doers about their work, their life experiences, and their perspectives on issues of our time. Today's guest is Dr. Teresa Gerladucci. She's a nationally recognized labor economist and the Bernard L. and Irene Schwartz Professor of Economics here at the New School, where she also directs the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis. I can't wait to get her take on what's happening in this evolving economy of ours. Teresa, thank you so much for being here with me today. I'm really glad to be here. Well, listen, I want to jump right in and uh, with the first question. When did you know that you wanted to be an economist? And was there ever a time when you thought you might do something different than that? Uh, well, that's an easy um, question because <laughs> I've always wanted to be an economist. Really? Um, there, and this is actually a very familiar story among female economists mm -hmm. we've discovered as we talk to each other. My father was an engineer of sort, mm -hmm. um, and it turns out almost all the female economists I know, their fathers fixed things. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to fix things, and when I took a class in high school, beginning high school, I learned about economics, and I read a book called The Worldly Philosophers wow. the same time. And The Worldly Philosophers um, was written by Robert Heilbrunner, and in the fine print, it said, Robert Heilbrunner teaches at the New School. So economics Lodge, and the New School mm -hmm. were always twinned in my mind. Well, listen, um, sticking to the theme of the economy for a moment, yeah. do you think we're headed into a recession yeah. in the near future? Yeah. Absolutely, mm -hmm. because the Federal Reserve wants one. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the past few months, they have said, we don't like them. but we're, we're good at it. Mm -hmm. um, the Federal Reserve is good at creating recessions. Mm -hmm. They're not so good at stimulating the economy. Mm -hmm. That's really Congress's um, responsibility, but they're really good at causing recessions. So you've really spent a lot of your career thinking about the economics of retirement. Um, and yeah. um, tell me what, for, I mean, how yeah, did you what, get into that? Yeah, what, what is drew that? you yeah. to that? Yeah. Uh, particular subset of, of work in economics. Yeah, so um, I, I'm known as a re retirement economist, mm -hmm. retirement finance re economist, mm -hmm. because in careers you build really long, narrow little holes. Yeah. So I work small, but I think big. Uh, and obvious, <laughs> obviously. Right? But, yeah. Yeah. And the, the bigger context is that about the way an economy and a society treats workers can be seen by how it treats its retired workers. Mm. So you can go all over the world, and if you know what their pension system is, yeah. or how they arrange for very vulnerable people who've worked all their lives, then you know a lot about that society. Mm. Mm -hmm. Also, retirement is fascinating, because it's not only about what workers can achieve for themselves, mm -hmm. and what they can demand from their employers and society, uh, it also has to do about the human condition, mm -hmm. how we think of ourselves in different ages, and it also has to. Um, it also involves huge gobs of money in yeah. big pots, and so I'm fascinated by the engineering of the finances of it, as well as the human experience that people have as they age and they reflect about their their product of their labor. So much more to to dig into there. I'm going to push you. Let's one yeah, more little yeah. question. Um, what if, if what's the source of the fascination? Yeah, you know? um, just to be with that I for understand. a moment. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Um, my my mother um, um, had different kinds of work lives, but mm -hmm. when she joined a union, um, when I was probably around fifteen, sixteen, mm -hmm. her life really changed. Mm -hmm. She had to work a lot harder. Mm -hmm. The sexual harassment at the job. She was only thirty. Um, at the time stopped mm -hmm. um, and also she got a lot of fringe benefits yeah. health insurance and something called a pension and I was just fascinated with that and so six years later when I was in graduate school at Berkeley mm -hmm. we were in California 
I was asked by her union if I would help them in their negotiations against the Sacramento Bee. I, My I, mother's. There's <laughs> almost always a personal oh, right? story behind right? these things, right? I right. find that whenever you talk to scholars of any ilk, almost um, their passion for something usually comes from someplace deeply personal. So I want to continue on this theme of, of your expertise, uh, particularly around. Uh, retirees and older workers, yeah. how are they being impacted yeah. in this current economy? Yeah. What do you what do you see happening there? Right. So, um, you know, I'm the director of the Retirement Equity Lab, mm -hmm. and retirement wasn't a cool word when we uh, when we adopted it. And retirement equity has yeah. become very important. We were very busy starting April 2020. You know, when the pandemic I can hit. Really imagine. Um, there was a sea change in the labor market. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody got to go home um, who could go home, mm -hmm. um, but many people had to, um, to work. Yeah. And there was also a huge um, um, layoffs, you know, unemployment, yeah. not just you know, going, working at home or a temporary layoff, there was you know, firings and yeah. quitting. And yeah. for the first time, older workers were let go faster and sooner than the younger workers. Mm. That had never happened since the time we ever measured um, the differences in age groups. Mm -hmm. Now it may look like a lot of retirements, but it was firings. Mm -hmm. And they were let go in their late 50s and early 60s. So that means they will um, have to draw on whatever little pension they had mm -hmm. before they wanted to, um, and also collect their Social Security a lot earlier. And we are looking forward in the next five to 10 years, a lot more downward mobility from lower middle class or middle class life to, to measurable poverty. Mm -hmm. So I expect the poverty rates to go up among um, the uh, older, older population. population. So I think this, so that's the economic consequences. Mm -hmm. It'll affect the entire communities because communities are healthier when there's dignified and and well-resourced older people in their communities. Yeah. Um, they watch the block, they go to the, to the local store. But it may mean a political upheaval because older people vote. Yeah. They have the highest rate of voting participation. One of the reasons we have so mm -hmm. many older people mm -hmm. um, working is because they, can't, they don't have anything to fall back on. Yeah. So we're proletarianizing. Um, um, are older people. In a way, we've run out of teenagers, we're running out of migrants, and now mm -hmm. we're going to the, um, um, the over 65 set. Uh, in April, uh, you wrote in Forbes, America's elders die sooner and are sicker yeah. than their counterparts in other rich nations. American elders also must work longer than their cohort abroad. These trends mean that Americans get fewer years of healthy retirement life uh, than elders in comparably wealthy nations five years less, in fact. Reading that, I mean, for me as a, you know, as the uninitiated, not yeah. an economist, was an astonishing fact. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you say more about, about yeah. that and what you've seen yeah. um, across nations in this regard? Yeah, um, yeah, one of the more basic things that we have to ask ourselves is how long should someone have to work before they can um, control the pace and content of their time before they die. Mm -hmm. That's a basic social political question. Mm -hmm. And workers and, and, and parties um, uh, work hard to answer that question. In this country, it's been about 35 to 40. And then you reap the benefits of medical uh, advances and you get to have a healthier life mm -hmm. before you die. These look medical. It looks economic, it looks engineering, it's all political. Mm -hmm. And so American workers lost mm -hmm. <laughs> in all those areas. We weren't since the Reagan years, and it coincided with a um, revolution in economic thought called liberalism. Mm -hmm. And it coincided with governments changing to a neoliberal point of view that the market knew better, yeah. that the less government intervention the better, and we took it really seriously. Mm -hmm. And we privatized our, um, our pension systems. We told employers, oh, you can um, have a 401k for a worker, and they can invest the money if they want, or you don't have to. Yeah. Um, we actually shrunk our social security systems. And so 40 years later, we're reaping the ex the, the, um, uh, um, our experiment with neoliberalism on steroids. So tell me, I mean, as you think about going back to the politics of this yeah. uh, work, 
Um, are there policies, are there um, <laughs> opportunities that we have to be able to make a, a real difference in that bleak version of the future? Yeah. Right? So I'm really glad you asked that yeah. question because another part of my, of my semester is that Congress is back in, in yeah. session and I've been working all my life, um, all my, all my, my um, academic life since graduate school, mm -hmm. um, to pass a legislation that would provide universal pensions for all Americans. Mm. So that it's not just a, a voluntary thing. I, 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 maybe you don't know that only half of Americans have a pension at work. Actually, I didn't you, know, you know Most people don't know that. Um, at any one point in time, only half of Americans have any way to save for their retirement at work. And that's because we have a voluntary, commercial, individually directed system. Yeah. And that's yeah. just wrong in equity reasons, wrong efficiency reasons. It's a short-term benefit for that employer and it's a long-term cost for all of us. So this Congress, there is finally a bill meaning um, put through Congress to give access to all workers who don't have a retirement plan access to a way to save for money, whether their employer does it or not. Yeah. It's really going to be a tale of two retirements where we have mm -hmm. people who have done very, very well. They've had a steady job their whole life. Oh. They have high incomes. Their incomes have gone up as they've gotten older. Um, they, um, the stock market has been very, very good yeah. to the people who have money and people who have had intermittent lives, you know, uh, lives, jobs, yeah. and family life yeah. um, are going to be old in a more unequal old age than we've ever seen. Now, I think about my own um, parents and the kind of retirement they're having. Um, it's, you know, it is a tale of two retirements because yeah. um, their retirement wouldn't be possible if it weren't for me helping to subsidize yeah, that, right? right? Um, right. And I, I wonder yeah. monthly, right, what it would mean if I weren't here I know. for them, right? I know. That actually, it's one of the things that frightens me, right, yeah. most. Um, and there are a lot of people uh, oh. at their stage of life who've worked hard, right? Yeah. Uh, they were both textile workers, right? Were they? In yeah, the both textile workers and um, both retired. Mm but hardly having what you know one would call the retirement of the American dream. Right? You know, so you actually mentioned something I should have. We're doing a big research project on this. It's on the intergenerational consequences yeah. of the lack of retirement security. Yeah. And I just saw it in your eyes. Yeah. It's that uh, we are finding a lot of adults n not knowing how to take care of themselves, their own retirement, their children, and caring yeah. with time and money for their time Absolutely. and money for their um, for their older parents and it is it causes a disruption all through the family yeah. um, that has not been studied enough I appreciate that so I want to switch gears a little bit and uh, ask you um, your thoughts about the inflation reduction act oh. um, what do you what do you think of it um, do you think this is good policy yeah. <laughs> well it used to be called. <laughs> yeah. Build back better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. And um, rebranding. Right, yeah. right. Um, so it, it it has a lot of those elements. Mm -hmm. So the Inflation Reduction Act is about building uh, a better infrastructure, mm -hmm. so that um, costs later on um, are lower. Mm -hmm. now, so there is an inflation mm -hmm. um, aspect to it. Um, but what the act does is it um, provides a way for the government to negotiate lower. F um, um, prices, you know, mm. for um, for uh -huh. pharmaceuticals. Now, I knew I I didn't think that was what you thought I was going to say. I did not. I thought you were going to say I was going to talk about climate change. Yeah. Right. And I will. Yeah. Okay. But you <laughs> have to know, and everybody has to know that a big part of why that bill passed and why it was bipartisan mm -hmm. was because it um, helps. Um, Americans pay less for drug prices and though it is not as important yeah. a global planetary generational crit you know uh, issue for even for critters that yeah. are on this earth yeah. <laughs> um, but it's it's the politics of it mm -hmm. it is the most important thing for the people who vote is the cost of health care so don't forget about politics you have to 
care about what people care about. And so they care about the short term. So it delivers a big short term promise. Mm -hmm. um, it is the most significant move we have made as a nation mm -hmm. to help um, save the planet. Yeah. Just that simple. It is going to help com um, companies move away from carbon profits to, um, to alternative fuel profits. We're not going to change their stripes. Yep. What they do is their profit making, mm -hmm. um, but they um, do need some collective action. Mm -hmm. They need to be steered in the same area because firms are really not good at thinking past the moment or yeah. thinking collectively. Just That's like not place else. They think in silo. It's also not their job. Their line. It's yeah, it's right. not the way st um, stock you yeah. know holders are That's supposed right. to think. So we needed the legislation for companies that want to do the right thing to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, so it is. A, a, a bill that will pay off later. Mm -hmm. And what I really like about it is that um, Democrats and Republicans signed off for it. Now, more Democrats than Republicans, but let's call it a bipartisan bill. Well, speaking of um, the, the Democratic Party and um, some of the um, big political actions uh, of late, student loan forgiveness yes. is another one. Yes. Um, I, I candidly, I've been surprised by some of the backlash. Yeah. Well, I'm totally not surprised by the backlash. No. Um, um, people have a deep sense of, of equity. And student mm -hmm. loans had a lot, of, um, a, put, um, a lot of personal responsibility attached to it. Mm -hmm. You were taught that of all the debt that anybody can um, hold, you couldn't discharge it in bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. A terrible, terrible policy. Mm -hmm. We went along with it in yeah. higher education, but it was an equitable, unfair, and just terrible policy um, when we said you couldn't discharge mm -hmm. student debt mm -hmm. in, in bankruptcy. So I suspected that people were cut off because they just paid off their loans or were just beginning and were starting to accrue a lot of loans would realize that there was, there was people who were in the same situations were treated differently and that violates what's called vertical equity. Interesting. So I expected yeah. that from my first days and in I public. And I, of course, come to this with a completely different frame, right? Well, I'm thinking, you know, higher education yeah. ought to be a right for more people, right? Well, and there you go. As opposed to a priv seen as a privilege. Yeah. So well, the more we can do to make it easier, to forgive loans, to make um, yeah. it more accessible and less expensive, yeah. right, um, the better. And so I just thought this is a great, this is a big win. But well, yeah. well, it, well, and that was all he could get. Yeah, that was all he could get. Um, the Re Republicans did not want to make community college for free. Yeah, tell me a little bit about um, how you think the markets are going to impact oh. the upcoming midterm elections. <laughs> um, you know, we haven't disclosed our political parties, yeah. and I I think most of the time people don't know where I am um, when I when I'm teaching yeah. um, class. But, um, we're talking. Oh, Openly, though, about the political parties, um, the the um, the midterms do often um, throw out the dominant party. Yeah, that's been the, tra uh, the tradition. But you, yeah. yeah, but but you asked me about the markets. Um, mm -hmm. I think that they won't matter as much. Mm -hmm. um, I think the trend on unemployment will matter, mm -hmm. um, and if the um, if unemployment really stays the same. Um, then I think the party in power would not be looked at as um, as um, as failing them. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, bigger forces are going to change the, um, the is going to are going to affect the midterms, and that's human rights, mm -hmm. and that's the human rights for 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 women, yeah. hu women's human rights to get the med medical care they need. That does seem to be dominant. Well, tell me this: um, as you think about what's on the horizon for yeah. you. Um, as a scholar um, for the Schwartz yeah. Center that you run yeah. here at the New School. Yeah. Um, what are the things that are on the horizon? What are you excited yeah. about? Yeah. Yeah, I've already mentioned some of them, yeah. but the Schwartz Center, um, named after our, our initial benefactor, Bernard Schwartz, mm -hmm. is the Center for Economic Policy Analysis, and it's part of the department. And why? Are, why? And it's to, um, it's to translate all that heady academic work that many of my colleagues do in many mathematical equations mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. lift it up and out into what it might mean for policy making, for, 
for policy making as an activist, as a company, or as a, as a, a lawmaker. So I'll end with one question um, uh, for our students, really. And yeah. as you think about um, those of them who are who recently graduated, who are going to be graduating in the next year or so, yeah. um, into a yeah. rather uncertain economy, yeah. um, right. where we are almost assuredly going to be in a recession, mm -hmm. um, what is your advice and yeah. counsel to them? Right. Uh, it's, it's really important for them to know that college graduates have a much lower unemployment rate yeah. than other people. So whatever you do, students, <laughs> 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 um, get, get the badge, yeah. graduate, whatever it takes. Um, and um, there, there may be lots of going on in your life, but finish, get that what we call sheepskin. Yeah. They used to print it on sheepskin. Yeah. The other thing I tell students <laughs> is that you never get a job because you're wonderful. You get a job because you've convinced that potential employer that you can solve their problem mm -hmm. at this period of time. Mm -hmm. So you have to know, have the skills and the knowledge about their problem at that point in time and then you'll get hired. That's fabulous advice. <laughs> Thank you so much for Thank being you. with us to do this today. Our Good. first in person, yeah, uh, right. one of these. So thank you so <laughs> thank much. You. And, and we could touch each other. Just a Not real pleasure. Zoom. A real pleasure. <laughs> thank you, Teresa. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.